I can't get my glasses straight. Do I need to go get your glasses? Where are they? <laughs> get them straight. Where are you going? This is me. killing me. me. I'm already live. That's just really funny. Oh. But no, the one the one side over here, it's way, way up off of my eye. Well, Look at that. Adjust it. This is killing me. This is so funny. <laughs> Sorry to start the video this way, folks. I put on those glasses, and all of a sudden, I realized the one lens was like up this way on my one eye, whereas the other was nice. But it just made me giggle. Anyways, it's good to see you tonight, and uh, trust that God is being good to you uh, this week. Today is my son's birthday, so I'm really excited about that. Of course, uh, always better to have a birthday than not. So let's see if. No, it's still crooked. It's, it still won't go. Where are your other glasses? They're up on the pew. The, on the platform? On the, yeah, on the bench. There's two pairs. It's the one that's not on top of the Bible. That's the pair that I'm needing. My regular desk glasses are up on the pew at the front of the church, and I cannot get this to look good for anything. Maybe if I tilt my head this way. But uh, anyway, um, I trust I trust that things are going well, and and uh, it, you know we're going to pray together. Uh, if you know if you want to sign in and say hello, please use the comments and do that because it's always great to see who is here and who's joined us. And I'm sorry about my glasses being all cockeyed over here. Don is coming back with my regular ones. I'll I'll look a tad bit better then, but at least I can see. So let's have prayer together, okay? Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for your love and mercy that has brought us this far and continues, Lord, to guide and to lead us. Lord, as you bring the church into revival and as you uh, bring us closer and closer to that time, I pray, Father, that you would continue to reform our understanding of you, help us to be biblical, help us to be uh, merciful, help us to be honest and help us to be willing to be examined by the scripture. I pray, Father, that your hand would be on us to guide and direct us as a church. And uh, for those, Lord, that are joining us uh, in other parts of the world, we just want to thank you for them. And we want to thank you, Lord, for the time of fellowship we have, even if the only thing connecting us is this uh, computer system that we enjoy in this day and age. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Well, um, here comes better glasses than these. You need to get rid of those. So. Rimless are terrible for keeping an adjustment. There we Absolutely go. Absolutely awful. I still got a little bit of a... That's better, though. Okay. Back in the drawer, those go. We uh, ended at uh, the tail end. We still have one more question yet on the previous study guide which uh, ends with with uh, Romans 13 verse 8 so um, we're going to go ahead and pick up at Romans chapter 13 and uh, verse 5 and uh, then we'll move on to the new study guide which was posted on the Facebook profile page just below where you're probably seeing the video if you're looking at us on the profile page so uh, Romans chapter 12 I see and where's the 13 there you are all right starting up at verse 5 wherefore ye must needs be subject not only for wrath but also for conscience sake for this cause pay ye tribute also for they are God's ministers attending continually upon this very thing Render therefore to all their uh, dues, their oh their dues, okay. Tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Owe no man anything, but to love one another. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. Now. Paul is going to use verse 8 as a transitional verse. So when we get to the next study guide, we'll begin at verse 8 again. But uh, I want us to, to take a look at this. Now remember that last week we were talking about being subject 
to authorities that are on this earth. The Bible does not qualify whether these are good or bad authorities, or whether these authorities are doing what is kind and benevolent to others, or whether they are malevolent. It doesn't specify that whatsoever. What it specifies is that God ordained them to be there, whether, and, and we have to say whether good or evil, because it, the Bible does not say God ordains every good authority. It just says God ordains authority. Now, we also took a look at the, uh, the prophets, and, and, well, you could also even say Joseph, for that matter, who lived obediently before God, and in the course of their obedience to God, they got thrust into foreign kings, foreign powers, and uh, in the case of Elijah, it was not a foreign power, but it was a it was a decidedly evil king that he had to serve God while he was under that king's authority. Now, God regularly moved Elijah here and there. There were 7,000 prophets that had not uh, bowed the knee to Baal, and Obadiah had hidden away a portion of them in a cave. And so, in, sp in spite of the fact that there was this evil king, God was still preserving his obedient prophets. It's the same thing here, okay? We, we don't go and help them, for goodness sakes, if they're evil. We don't go and help them. But we also don't go and harm them either. And now somebody asked me the other day, in the course of this conversation, what about Dietrich Bonhoeffer? Well, this is what I'll say about the Dietrich Bonhoeffer thing, because he did join in a plot to try and rid the world of, of Hitler. Um, most of us on a humanist level, on a human level, we would say absolutely Bonhoeffer, go for it. Uh, but Bonhoeffer was, it, it, I believe Bonhoeffer to have been a biblical Christian. In fact, probably a biblical Christian in the midst of one of the toughest situations that history has ever known. And so I don't have, I don't have a problem whatsoever with Bonhoeffer. And uh, I would say this, that, that uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer uh, in the course of obeying the Lord may have been told by God to be a part of this or Dietrich Bonhoeffer in the course of serving the Lord m may have done what seemed right to him at the time but I don't know that I wasn't living in Dietrich Bonhoeffer's skin at the time okay so what I know is this if God commands us to do such and such we have to Okay, whether it is uh, wh whether it is something that uh, seems to the letter or not is irrelevant. The only consistency throughout the whole Bible is the will of God. That's the only consistency, because the same God that told them to sacrifice animals as an atonement sacrifice in the days of Moses, in the days of of uh, of Isaiah, he said, I've had enough of the blood of the bulls of goats and rams. Who's asked this of you, this trampling of the courts? Okay, so so all of a sudden, the letter seems to have changed. But God remained consistent. The purpose in the animal sacrifices was, according to Hebrews, it was to demonstrate the atonement of Christ that was to come. Okay, now when that was no longer teaching anybody anything in Isaiah's time, and they were actually having having fun killing animals, and it was actually becoming a part of a celebration, and the death of an innocent animal for their sins no longer cut them to the heart, and it was no longer doing its job, God said that's enough. I've had enough of the blood of bulls and rams and goats. That's it. Okay, so here we see that the letter changed. Now, this is just one example. I can give you more examples, but I don't want to belabor us. Okay, so if you'll pardon me for that. But, but here's a situation where the letter changed, but the spirit did not. 
And so then we see what in the scripture uh, that Paul writes. It says, it says, for the letter of the law brings death, but the spirit of the law brings life. Okay, so it's referring back to, and Paul refers back to this, that while the letter may change, the spirit does not. And what is the spirit of the scripture? The will of God. The will of God in all matters. Okay? So when God calls us to be subject to the authorities and the powers that he has ordained, that he has either allowed to come to power or himself has put into power, uh, that 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 means that we are to not interfere because that's God's territory and we stay away from it. We don't interfere with it. How does that apply to vaccine mandates? How does that apply to vaccine mandates? Because it's a leadership that again, is living with these mandates. Right, but again though, the in the midst of this whole vaccine mandate question and, and uh, the controversies over it, it is still that it's incumbent upon us to obey the Lord. And, and however God is leading you, however God is telling you to obey him, obey him. In some cases, it may be that in order to not hurt your witness, you're going to have the mask. We're, we're going to read about this a little bit more in, in uh, Romans 14 when we get into the idea of, of uh, you know, eating meat or not eating meat or this kind of thing. So in this particular case with the vaccination question, it would be simply this. You may be in a situation where if you don't have a mask, the people are going to, feel, are going to be so conscious about the idea that they don't think you're being safe that you won't be able to talk to them about the gospel. In another case, if you have the mask, the people that you're talking to may think that you support some kind of a political agenda and it may be difficult for them in that particular setting to hear the gospel. The, the, the point, mask or no mask, is irrelevant. The, the point of what we're trying to do is obey the Lord and bring the gospel message to various groups and various types of people. And so, as Paul says in another place, so to the Jews I become like a Jew, to the Gentiles I become like a Gentile, to the slaves I become like a slave. And he doesn't mean that he's duplicitous in that particular case. What he's trying to say is, whatever does not prevent the gospel, that's the path that I'm going to take. And so, the gospel above all things, the will of God above all things, and uh, then uh, if God then has set uh, over us authorities or powers that uh, have given us uh, difficulty or maybe are very malevolent uh, in their approach to ruling, uh, we then have to depend upon God. And like Elijah, we may have to live in desert places. Um, you know, the scripture says that, that uh, when the righteous are in control, that the, the land rejoices, but uh, the righteous go into hiding when the wicked go into power. So the scripture is, is uh, definitely giving us a, a clear road map uh, if we take it all together at the same time. Now here, Paul is advocating the adage, when in Rome, uh, do as the Romans do. Uh, if not, uh, why would God desire we should show this great level of honor to those in power without qualifying whether they are good or evil powers? Let me return us to the scripture quickly because we did have a little bit of a body of information that may have distracted. Okay. Uh, wherefore you must needs be subject not only for wrath but also for conscience sake. For this cause pay ye tribute also, for they are God's ministers attending continually uh, upon this very thing. And then it gives you examples of how to do that. The, the reasoning behind this is in verse 6. Okay, for this cause pay ye tribute also, for they are God's ministers uh, attending continually upon this very thing. Now, let's, uh, in, instead, of, instead of looking at the extremes of, say, a Hitler, or the extremes of, say, a King Arthur, 
or whatever. Uh, let's look at typical powers. Typical powers are are somewhat uh, subject to their concern about public opinion and somewhat are subject to their own flesh. Okay, and it usually creates at least some kind of a balance in which God is still able to provide a place for the gospel within that particular political setting. Now that's under normal circumstances. We do have, like I said, we have the extreme situations. And as I said in the extreme situations, whether you're serving under King Arthur or Hitler, uh, you still are going to have to do what you feel God is telling you to do vis-a-vis uh, -vis the scripture. So whether, uh, whether or not uh, we are in the middle or to the edges, it's still the, the will of God. That's the thing that concerns us. Okay. Now, that being said, um, God is asking us to honor the men, even though they may not be Christians or may not be believers, most likely are not. We're supposed to offer, uh, honor these men, um, even in some cases women, uh, we're supposed to honor them with tribute, we're, in other words, taxes. Okay, the word tribute there means taxes. Okay, we're supposed to pay the taxes. We're supposed to, we're supposed to do all of the things that a citizen is supposed to do. And why? Because we're trying to find ways to not hinder the gospel. Okay, it has nothing to do ultimately with these men or these women that happen to be leading at the time. It ultimately has to do with the fact that you are obeying God. And if God has said, pay, has said, pay tribute and treat these people as my agents to you, then treat them that way. Now again, we do have the, the you know, the, the extreme, the edges. Okay, and I understand that. But you cannot govern the way that you would normally understand the scripture uh, from somewhere in the middle by asking yourself only the tough questions at the outside edges. Now, I'm not saying that that's not helpful. Obviously, it is helpful. We've been talking about it quite a bit last week and a little bit here at the beginning and this week. Okay, so, so we do everything we can to make certain we're like David running from Saul in the wilderness. God gives us opportunities if we want to, uh, to escape. And yet, instead, we just say, I will not lay a hand on the Lord's anointed. And we say, give room to vengeance, for the Lord said, vengeance is mine, and I will repay. And so we give room to the Lord's vengeance. And uh, this is not a pacifist approach, it's an obedience approach. Okay, pacifism has nothing to, that, that's a, pacifism is okay until it's no longer okay. Because there's sometimes where pacifism is not okay. Sometimes, sometimes a young man, even a young Christian man, has got to go to war for, to protect their own country and their own home. Okay, that's just all there is to it. So there's, sometimes pacifism is called for, but sometimes action is called for. Um, but we don't know when that will be because as men, of, men and women of God, we don't govern ourselves based on what seems right to us at the time. We govern ourselves based upon the scripture, based upon the Holy Spirit's leading. When he prevent, providentially opens up doors, we go ahead and we go through those doors. Or we say to the Lord, Lord, you, you open doors that no man can shut. You shut doors that no man can open. Therefore, if you do not want me to go through this door, please shut it. Be good to me. Be kind to me. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Okay? And so our prayer then is, God, just shut the door if you don't want me to go through. But if you leave it open, and it seems like you're leading me this direction, then I am going to go through it. And, and I will, because of my own ignorance, because of my own sheep-like mentality, I'll wind up disobeying you even though I didn't intend to. 
Okay, so we need the leadership of God, and God is faithful. He leads us if we let him. But if we turn aside from that and we say, well, this seems right to me, so it must be from God. The Bible says every man's way seems right to him, but in the end it is death. Okay, so every man does what is right in his own eyes, but in the end it is death. Therefore, we have to remember, we also remember this, the heart is wicked and deceitful above all things. Who can know it? Okay, so we remember these two things and we remember you cannot do just what seems right to you at a given time. You have to carefully weigh this out in accordance with the Holy Spirit. He opens doors that no man can shut. He shuts doors no man can open. Revelation chapter 3. Do not forget that. Okay? Um, so, in this business of submitting to authorities, we do so as emissaries from heaven to aid them in the jobs that God has given them, whether they recognize that God has given them the jobs or not. Um, so, so that is uh, that is the reason now Paul again Paul is not saying when in Rome do what the Romans do okay he's not saying that now I, I know that we we already talked about to the Jews I become like a Jew to the Gentiles like a Gentile to the slaves I become like a slave to the free men like a free man I understand that but that's but he's not trying to say be disingenuous and be a chameleon and just try to fit in that's not at all what he's saying. He's saying any barrier that there is to the gospel, remove the barrier. Because if it's if it's not if it's not a matter of obedience uh, to maintain, I mean, unless God tells you to maintain that barrier, why maintain that barrier? Okay, if it's an expendable barrier, just remove it. Just re who cares? You know, mask or no mask. If you're with a group of people that are scared of the virus, wear a mask. Just, just go ahead and wear a mask. Who cares? Okay? And and if you're with a group of people that feel that wearing a mask is somehow capitulating to the government, don't wear a mask then. Because to you, the mask is nothing. To you, the Holy Spirit is everything. And he either sustains you for life or he does not sustain you for life. And you have, you, you have to be happy for God to either give you life or take it from you. Because he does what he wills at the times that he wants to do what he wills. And he does it for his own glory and his own great name's sake. And ultimately you live or die by that glory. Okay, so... <clears throat> we're going to, like I said earlier, we're going to read more about this when we get into... Uh, Romans 14. So we're going to pick up the next study guide at this point, and we're going to start out once again at uh, Romans 13, 8, and then we're going to read down through verse 10. Okay? Romans 13, 8 down through verse 10. O to no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. For this thou shalt not commit adultery, Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet, and if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, name, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Okay, now, looking in the setting that we're already in, the context that we're already in, is Paul advocating for an obedience to the law as a means of salvation or a means of expressing salvation? Um, often when we see this, there are those that, that have already have the mentality in their head that that uh, not only is salvation itself tenuous, but the maintaining of salvation is tenuous, and the completion of salvation is tenuous, and nobody is absolutely sure they're going to get into heaven until the day of judgment when Christ will separate the sheep and the goats, and 
the there's a theology out there that believes the sheep are going to be just as surprised as the goats. Um, I had a I had a man come uh, from an insurance company. I won't give you the name of the insurance company, but he came to Wisconsin. I was I had uh, hit a turkey uh, with the hood of my car. And he came to the to the car to look at it, to look it over. He was an insurance inspector. Came and take took a look at it, and we had a discussion. And I came across the fact that he was Catholic. And the one thing that he said to me when I when we talked about heaven and we were talking about God, and he he said that he thinks it's arrogant for anybody to imagine whether or not they're going to go to heaven, and that we all just have to find out on that day. Well, that's it's typical Catholic theology. And there's a lot of theology that flows out of that. But, uh, but that's not biblical theology. Biblical theology is that Christ has already taken care of the covenant so that salvation is secured in him. Not only that, but that Christ has taken up the cause of sanctification so that you and I are going to be sanctified through the Holy Spirit's work in Christ and then he's already taken care of the completion of our salvation, for he says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. Okay, so we understand that, that the Christian does not engage in the law as a means to salvation, or as a means to maintain their salvation, or as a means of completing the salvation experience. But instead we engage in the disciplines of the law as a means of expressing our salvation. Okay? It is, it is completely inappropriate for someone who God has made uh, an ambassador from heaven to express their salvation through fleshly means. It is absolutely appropriate for a spiritual being who has been created and has been given a spirit from heaven to express their salvation through a heavenly means. And therefore we walk in holiness not by not not for the purpose of maintaining salvation, but as a purpose means of expressing salvation. So if you and I then are walking in holiness, that is, we're walking in the obedience that comes by faith, okay? Because you and I are not holy, nor are we made holy uh, right now. We are being made holy, the Bible says. That's an expression that can be translated as, as, as sanctification, okay? The sanctification process is the process of being made holy, um, but sanctification is not itself holiness, and your flesh is never converted uh, to holiness. And so if you continue to walk by the flesh, the Bible says you will die. If you walk by the Spirit, however, the Bible says you will live. Okay? So our expression of our salvation is through the discipline of following the laws of God. However perfectly or imperfectly we're following them, that's where our discipline is. So this idea that just because God through Jesus Christ is taking care of our salvation, that we're somehow saying that it doesn't matter what we do, as Paul wrote in Romans in chapter 5 and, and, chap and the beginning of chapter 6, you know, what do we say then? Shall we continue to sin so that grace may increase? And he said that there, are, there were those that were already, uh, at that point, were already falsely reporting that that is what they keep saying. And that is not at all what they were saying. Okay, what they were saying is that since salvation has been taken care of by a much better blood and a much better flesh, that you and I will ever have, that of Jesus Christ, that we now walk in the discipline of the Scripture rather than walking in the fear of the Scripture. And so now we walk in the discipline, which means where it comes to um, taking care of our neighbors and watching over our neighbors, uh, Paul takes the last six of the Ten Commandments 
the six that pertain to uh, the shortened version, which is love your neighbor as yourself. And, pardon me? There's only five listed there. Only five listed Honor there? On your father and mother isn't listed. On your father and your mother's not listed. Okay. Well, um, still, uh, he takes those five at least. And he says they can be summed up in the command, love your neighbor as yourself. Okay, so then, uh, in loving my neighbor as myself, I don't do that to acquire salvation. I do that as a means of expressing salvation. And I honor, do not covet, and do not bear false witness, and do not commit adultery, and do not steal, and do not kill. I honor those by loving my neighbor. And the Bible says, therefore, love fulfills the, um, the law. Now, what again, this does not mean that if you do not love people perfectly, you will not fulfill the law. What it means that here is that God has given you his love, an ability to love others in a way you couldn't have before. And walking in that love by the Holy Spirit, you're actually fulfilling the purpose or the point or the concern of the law, at least those five, and others that pertain to those five. <clears throat> and he says that you're loving your neighbor as yourself now, but you're doing so as a matter of discipline, no longer as a matter of trying to qualify yourself uh, for, uh, for heaven. Um, the uh, second question is, discuss the reconciliation of Romans 10.4 with this passage. And I'm just going to invite you to turn back to Romans 10.4 really quick. And it says this, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Christ is the end of the law. Okay? So, obviously there's a qualification to righteousness for them that believe okay I, I don't want to I don't want to somebody to say hey you forgot about the qualification it is yes the qualification is there I want to discuss that part okay Christ is the end of the law okay when Christ died on the cross the law died in its sway over us as a condition for salvation okay so now the law is over with which, which the scripture then says, uh, not that, not that uh, Christ fulfilled the law and so that you could be empowered to fulfill the law, which I think some people do believe that that's what the passages are, passages of scripture are trying to say to us. I, I don't know. I, I think I did at one point as a kid but as you grow up and you begin to graduate from those kinds of those kinds of uh, misconceptions, I, I don't think that you really continue in that if as you're reading the scripture, because Christ didn't die on the cross fulfilling the law for your salvation, so that He could empower you to now fulfill the law as a means of maintaining or sustaining that salvation until He should return. Uh, if that were the case, then then I would have to direct your attention back to Galatians 2.21, which says that if that was the case, Christ died for nothing. Okay? If, he, if his death is sufficient and has absolutely saved you, then the law becomes uh, a discipline that teaches us how to live holy lives. It teaches us how to live in godliness. It teaches us how to live in sustaining faith. And that's the biblical testimony. So these two passages are reconciled in that Christ is the end of the law or the end of the fear or the power of the law, whereas we continue in the law not as a means of of sustaining our salvation, but as a means of expressing our salvation. The salvation that we have is expressed in our desire 
to keep those things which God has given us because they are holy. Now, you might say, well, then should we go back to all of the different laws, the, the dietary laws and all that? Now, everything that is fulfilled in Christ is fulfilled in Christ. We have two things that we're supposed to be concentrating on. Now, we have to be careful. We don't preach these two things to people that don't know God. Okay, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. These are the two greatest commandments. These uphold the spirit of, of the will of God, which is the only consistent thing throughout Scripture. But if you tell these things to people that aren't saved, you say love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, why, those unregenerate people are going to believe in their hearts that I just need to love God as much as I'm capable of loving God, which is not what the scripture says. It says, love the Lord with all of your heart, all of your mind, all of your soul, all of your strength. Okay, emphasized all. Okay, which means that if you preach this to those who don't know the Lord, they're going to come up with this idea in their heads that, uh, that, well, the grace of God is such that he understands I can't love him with all, so I just love him with the best that I can. And then love your neighbor as yourself. Well, God understands that I've got some really hard-to-live-with neighbors, and so, you know, I'll just love them with the best that I can. And so then we wind up with a completely powerless gospel that cannot transform anybody, that cannot produce holiness in a person, that cannot produce any kind of, of genuine response of repentance, works of repentance, that demonstrate that something different is at work in you. Okay, so the... The, the, the question of what do I do if Christ has satisfied all the requirements of salvation, not just the initiation of it, but the sustaining of it, not just the sustaining of it, but the glorification of it, if he has taken care of all of those aspects, regeneration, justification, sanctification, glorification, if he has taken care of all those aspects, then the self-centered person says, well, then there's nothing left for me to do. I can sit back and coast. But that's not what a regenerate person does. The regenerate person has Christ at the center. Christ is at the center of their hearts, the center of their minds. Christ is the person they want to serve. More than anything else, they want to serve Christ. And how do they do that? They do that by going back to the scripture, not looking for the letter of the law, for the letter kills, but looking for the will of God in everything that has been taught. So he looks for the will of God in the law. He looks for the will of God in the dietary laws. He looks for the will of God, and the will of God is not the letter. For if God can break the letter of the law without breaking the spirit of the law, so also then we had ought to ask ourselves which part should we pay attention to. The letter that God himself set aside uh, from Moses to Isaiah or do we look to the will of God that that supersedes all of this and in satisfying God's will whether it's Jesus healing on the Sabbath which was a breaking of the letter but not of the spirit whether it was uh, whether it was uh, the disciples grabbing handfuls of grain as they walked through the field, which was a breaking of the letter, but not of the spirit. So where are you going to concentrate? Well, the man of God, the one who, or the woman of God, the one who has been regenerated, concentrates on the will of God. That's what he wants to satisfy. So he goes back to the law. He goes back to the, to the Old Testament, back to creation all the way through. And he looks for the will of God in the prophecies, in the histories, in the poetries, in the wisdom literature. He looks for the will of God in all of that. Not the letter, but the spirit of that will. 
the overriding will that does not change from the beginning of the scripture to the present day and will not change for the Lord is the same yesterday today and forever okay so here we find ourselves then with these this this command love your neighbor as yourself and say and Paul saying if this kind of love is being expressed through you then the law is fulfilled in you and it, there's a demonstration that repentance has come to you and therefore uh, the law is now fulfilled okay so that's the reconciliation between Romans 10 4 Christ is the end of the law to all to for righteousness to all them that believe and then this passage here that says that we are to uh, look for the uh, the practice of the law in our expression of salvation so that it demonstrates works that come out of repentance so let's look at verses 11 to 14 now picking up again at uh, chapter 13 now verses 11 to 14 and that knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed the night is far spent the day is at hand let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light let us walk honestly as in the day not in rioting and drunkenness not in chambering that means uh, secrecy um, and uh, wantonness which means carelessness or or uh, you know just kind of throwing off restraint not in strife and envying but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof okay so let's take a look at the uh, question here here we see the biblical analogy of spiritual sleep being used as in the Old Testament sometimes applied to the Lord sometimes applied to this to a city or even instruments why does the scripture speak of inactivity as sleep and what is being said to the church we have to be careful that we don't reduce the scripture to poetic expression however we also have to realize that sometimes poetic expression is being used by God metaphors analogies parables all being used by God to express a truth in a sense to hide it from those who are looking for the obvious so that uh, so that uh, those that are being taught by the Holy Spirit will be able to see clearly uh, that that this is uh, an obvious um, expression of poetry or whatever that is trying to give us an obvious truth now let me put things this way okay uh, if you've ever gotten a letter I'm not talking about an email but it could apply to email I suppose but if you've ever gotten a handwritten letter from somebody okay and you happen to have that handwritten letter and you're reading it and it has expressions and idioms and it has uh, it has colloquy and it has uh, references to inside jokes and it has references to things that the two of you know you can read it and you're gonna laugh and you're going to say oh yes and you're gonna fully understand what that person wrote to you because you understand their idioms you understand their colloquies you understand their expressions you understand the inside jokes all of that makes sense to you give that though to a stranger and the stranger is going to read into that things that that that, that you would be like no 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 he doesn't 
mean it that way. He means it this way. And you're going to be sitting there and coaching the stranger constantly because the stranger is going to say, how can they say this? This doesn't make any sense. And they're going to read through that. And you're going to say, oh, well, you see, there's this story. And if you don't know the story, then maybe that expression doesn't make much sense to you. Okay. Now, the only reason I bring this up is because that is the way the Bible is read. Somebody who is not regenerated and does not know the Lord is going to read the Bible and it's going, in some places, it's going to, it's going to make a kind of a sense to them. In other places, they're going to say, why in, why in the world would a loving God do such a thing? And it, it's just going to be a complete mishmash. And you're going to find yourself, if you're a believer, you're going to find yourself saying to somebody who is unregenerate, hey, look, you've got to understand, here's the context Here's the reason why. Here's the story that's referring back to. This is an expression that God uses a lot that means such and such a thing. And to the unbeliever, that's going to seem like you're spinning a yarn and trying to excuse God for something that they think was absolutely offensive. And ultimately, if the person does not know God, no matter how you explain the scripture to them, it is going to be nothing more than just a, a, a pale expression to them of what the gospel means. If they don't see the gospel living in you, working in you, then you're never going to be able to really explain anything. And if the Holy Spirit does not quicken them and open their eyes, they will never understand it for themselves. That's just the way that it is. I'm not saying that as a matter of philosophy. It's just the way that it is. Now, in the same way, when the scripture tells the Lord to wake up, <laughs> you're going to look at that and you're going to say, God sleeps? Was he get tired at night? No, 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 no. Because what does the Bible say also about the Lord? He neither sleeps nor does he slumber. <laughs> That's what the scripture says. So why in the world would it say in one place, wake up, O Lord? Like it does in the book of Psalms. Wake up, O Lord. What that means is that it's addressing apparent inactivity on the part of God. Now, God is not inactive. We understand that, okay? And you say, well, then why would God permit it to be said, wake up, O Lord? Because for our sakes, from our perspective, from our end of things, sometimes it just looks like, or it seems like, God's not at work. And you think, well, how did he let us get into this bad position? Wake up, O Lord! You know, how did he get us there? Wake up, oh God. In another place, it tells the instruments to wake up. Wake up, trumpet. Wake up, harp. Wake up, psaltery. <laughs> and uh, then it says to us, wake up, oh sleeper. There, there are expressions here that are talking about the inactivity. God sometimes... Sometimes he permits us to express ourselves to him by asking him to wake up to what's going on. In another place where there was not praise and the people were in mourning and they were grieved, the psalmist asked the instruments to wake up. In other places throughout the, the prophets, the prophets are telling Jerusalem to wake up. They're telling Israel to wake up. They're telling the, the believers to wake up. Uh, they, are, they are expressing that the inactivity of either God or the instruments or Jerusalem or Israel or even the church, that that inactivity is, is something that has to come to an end. Now, Paul's justification for that is uh, in verse 11, and that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awaken. And what, what Paul is saying is, if there ever was an excuse to be asleep, it's not now. Because everything that is needed for salvation has been accomplished in Christ. Not only has Christ 
kept the covenant of the Old Testament for us because we could not, and it was proven over a long period of time that no man, given the presence of God, the prophets of God, the provisions of God, the word of God, the angels, and all of this activity that we see in the Old Testament, no human being, human beings are so depraved that there is no human being, even with all of that help, that ever kept the covenant to its fullest. And a lot of people like to pull out from David the whole Bathsheba business. But that's you know, the only time that David failed. And it wasn't just the counting of the fighting men either. For we read in the, in the book of the Kings that in Josiah's day, the, pro, the Passover was celebrated, and it had never been celebrated so perfectly since the time of Moses, which means during the time of David, David even failed to keep the Passover the way that Moses had prescribed. And so, there, you know, just because we haven't read about all of David's failings doesn't mean he had two, and he was perfect the rest of the time. Okay, just because we, we don't read of all of Samuel's failings doesn't mean Samuel was perfect all the time. But we know that there was a lot of failings on Samuel's part because his two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, were horrible people. Just horrible. They were... Huh? Hophni and Phinehas weren't they Eli's sons? Were those Eli's sons that I mentioned? Okay, well, anyways, anyways, it might have been Eli's sons. You're right, you're right, it was Eli's. But nevertheless, nevertheless, Samuel's sons also, uh, they were horrible people as well. And they said, the, the people of, of Israel said, we will not have your sons ruling over us. So get us a king. And, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, it's Hophni and Phinehas were Eli's sons, definitely. Uh, they were the ones that took the uh, ark into the uh, in, into battle and and lost it to the Philistines. But uh, we see in the scripture not a one, not a single character or man or woman in the scripture ever kept the old covenant, and they had all of the equipment that you and I don't have. All of it. The presence of God, the power of God, the provision of God, the angels, the prophets, the word of God. Um, they had all of the tools that you and I don't have. And uh, you say, well, don't we still have God's power, provision, blah, blah, blah. Yes, sure we do, sure. But not firsthand. Not, you know, the people of Israel heard God's voice when they were at the base of Mount Sinai. Okay, they heard it, literally, actually heard it with their own ears. And they said, this is too much. And they said, Moses, don't have God talk to us directly anymore from now on. They, Since you can take it, let him talk to you, and then you can tell us what he said. And then they went for the rest of the time blaming Moses for everything. Moses said, God told him. So it, you take a look at the Old Testament and all you see is the depravity of man and the holiness of God and they're juxtaposed against each other and there's not even for a moment an intersectionality between the two of them at all. God's holiness is here. Man's lifestyle is down here and there is no back and forth at points where the only time where anything holy is ever accomplished is when an unholy man made holy by the Spirit of God obeys the Spirit of God does what the Spirit of God tells him to do and all of a sudden something great and holy occurs okay in the course of time with Moses okay when Moses obeyed the Lord everything was well with Moses but the people they rebelled and rebelled against the holiness of God. They didn't like it at all. Okay, and then you go to Joshua. As long as Joshua obeyed the Lord, everything went well. You get to the days of the judges, and that day Israel had no king. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes, and so God sold them into the hands of their enemies. 
And we see that all the way up to the tail end when we get to Samuel. And when we see Samuel, give us a king. Okay, so Samuel, uh, by God's leadership, he picks Saul. Saul demonstrates what it is to have a king that does not follow God. And while, while Saul obeys the Lord at first and God's able to do great things, towards the end, Saul's not obeying God and God takes his hand off of him, gives his approval to David, and now David is succeeding at everything that he does. Why? Because David obeys God. Not because David is special, because David obeys God. Now this all comes back to this whole business of, awake, of waking up. Okay, because this business of waking up from our sleep is waking up from our inactivity. And what inactivity? You and I are active every day doing our jobs and going about, but there's nothing spiritual going on. Why is there nothing holy going on? Because we are not obeying God by faith. We're not doing God's will. We're doing things that are inspired by God's will. There's a lot of pastors out there inspired by God's will. A lot of churches that are inspired by God's will. Uh, worship teams and and uh, you know special programming and all of this inspired by God. But none of it is a direct result of a command of God. Every church should be working in concert. Every church should be doing the will of God, obeying the will of God, and achieving what it is that God asks for them to achieve. And then when there's nothing to do specifically in that, they should be waiting on God. One of the biggest commands of the scripture is to wait on God. That is not slumber to wait on God. Waiting on God means this is time to prepare. This is time to train. This is time to learn. This is time to grow. This is time to get yourselves ready because action is about ready to happen. And when action is happening, it's too late to learn. I believe with all of my heart there is a big revival on the way. Huge. It's going to be worldwide. It's going to result in the set the division of of the of what will be known as Christianity. It will divide into biblical Christianity and Christian humanism. And Christian humanism is going to become the dominant worldwide religion. It will incorporate any other religion. They won't even have to give up their uh, their peculiarities. The Hindus won't have to stop being Hindus. They'll just be Hindu Christians now. And the uh, Muslims won't have to give up being Muslims. They'll just be Muslim Christians now. And uh, they'll try to get the Jews to join, but the Jews won't join. Uh, that's the scripture. The Jews won't join. Uh, you know, even now, the, the, you know, the voodoos, the Haitian voodoo people, they're Haitian Christians or voodoo Christians or whatever. Um, a friend of mine uh, told me about the Mayans that the that they have been incorporated into this universal Christian church already, and uh, so then they're you know they are able to continue to be Mayans or Aztecs or whatever, and and uh, they can call themselves Christians, so they can practice the Aztec religion as long as Christianity is their uh, top religion. So this kind of universalism is already going on. It's already at work. Okay. And uh, so when the time comes and there's a huge worldwide revival, it's just, it's just uh, not, a, doesn't take a whole lot of brain power to realize that this, that this particular movement, this Christian humanist movement, is going to seize upon that and try to take as, siphon off as many people from the revival as they can. And they'll be quite successful. Okay. Well, anyways, a revival is coming. It's going to be a grand revival. It's going to be worldwide. It's going to be massive. So if God's not doing anything in particular right now, you'd ought to be training. You'd ought to be, you'd ought to be reading your Bible. You'd ought to be uh, looking into the writings of some of the older pastors and some of the established preachers that you can trust. 
you should not be paying much attention to the humanist pastors. Right now, those pastors that are out there saying, God did all of this for you. God did all of that. No, he didn't. He did all of this for Christ. That's the scripture, okay? For thy pleasure, they were created. Okay, that's what it says in, Ro in uh, Revelation chapter 5. Okay, for thy pleasure were they created, they, the angels say to Christ. And so, uh, this is all for Christ's pleasure. You and I are for Christ's pleasure. We're created beings, created for his pleasure. Okay? So, here in this, in this, uh, in, in this uh, question, why uh, sleep means inactivity it doesn't mean waiting waiting is active okay I am actively waiting on the Lord how do I say that I say I'm actively waiting because while I'm waiting I'm training I'm reading my Bible I'm I'm reforming my own life by obedience I'm not reforming it because I, I'm doing it myself it's really Christ that is reforming my life. So waiting is active. It's not sleep. Okay? Sleep is when you're not even waiting on God. Sleep is when you're just living your life and you still have hopes and dreams that pertain to this life and you still have desires that are unfulfilled in this life. That's what sleeping is. It's high time that we awaken. According to the scripture... It's high time that we come out of our inactivity. <clears throat> it's high time that those who were once Christians and drifted from their faith snap to. Remember why you, you became a Christian. Remember that you became a Christian. Stop living by the flesh. Live by the Spirit. It is high time. God is about to move and if you're not trained and if you're not prepared and if you're not ready it's going to take you by surprise like a thief in the night and I'm referring the thief in the night analogy not to the ascension of the church but to instead to this next big move of God that's about to pour out upon the world okay you need to be ready for this you need to be prepared for it and if you're still sitting there and wiggling your, your fingers and your toes wondering when in the world it is you're going to have what you want out of this life, then you're going to be completely asleep and this whole thing is going to take you by surprise. And you're going to be ashamed in the day when the testing comes and when the, the revealing of, of the plan of God for revival comes. And I don't want that for you. I, I want you to be ready. I want you to be prepared. I want you to be serving the Lord. At the time, it will be by waiting, but then when the time of action comes, you're ready to go. So be training. What does it mean to put on the Lord Jesus Christ in contrast to making provision for the flesh? Okay? Putting on the Lord Jesus Christ is training. Okay? It is learning how to put on the way he thinks, the way he feels, his priorities. Imagine yourself, because you are, but you must imagine yourself because you've never been. You are a heavenly creature. You've been given the Spirit of Christ, the Bible says. And if you have the Spirit of Christ, then you belong to Christ. But the Bible says if you have not the Spirit of Christ, you are none of his. Okay? So if you have the Spirit of Christ then put it on. Okay, now, that's going to take training. It's going to take imagination. You're going to have to ask yourself, if I, if, if I could recall being born in heaven, and I was walking this earth like Jesus did, what would my perspective be? What would the paradigm, the... Um, structure of reality that I live in be? What would my priorities be? Uh, what, would, what would it be like for my heart? 
Christ was constantly praying. Jesus was always praying. He was always looking for God. He was he was always uh, watching for the opportunity to do what God wanted him to do. Uh, we assume that God must have given him some time off from time to time, but not time off from serving him, but that time to wait, that time to train, that time to to be born up. We understand from Matthew 4 and also from Luke 4 that there was a period of time where Jesus went into the wilderness and was tempted of the enemy, part of the training that, that he was given. And uh, we understand this whole training business from Hebrews chapter 5. Okay, so here we are at the end of today's hour. And we have gotten this far that the application of the salvation that we read of in Romans 1 to 11, it first of all begins with transforming of our minds, which is a godly thing that has to happen, Romans 12. It, it then moves into the concept of us being one flesh with Christ and with each other in Christ so that we understand that we are one person together with him. And then it moves from there into, let's begin at how we should live this out. First of all, respect authority and stay within those ordained authorities. Obey God in the midst of all of that and do not lose your focus. And then we move into, and where it comes to your neighbors. Love them as you would love yourself. And now we are coming to the point at which it says, wake up. It's time to wake up. Stop living for this world. Start living for for God and obey him through faith. And if he tells you to wait, that's not the time for you to throw off your responsibilities, but it's time for you to train. So are you waiting on God? Or are you asleep right now? Let's pray. Father, there are times, Lord, where even in the midst of waiting, I I still need to have those uh, down times, uh, times of kidding around with my brothers or sisters in Christ or kidding around with my family or, or watching a, a television show that probably doesn't amount to a whole lot of anything. Help me, though, not to eat the bread of idleness in the midst of all of that, I pray. Help us, Lord, I pray, to wait upon you by reading your word, by studying, by training, by being prepared. God, I pray that you would uh, seize upon our hearts and seize upon our minds right now to give us the, the uh, mentality that comes from Christ that our minds Lord would be like his and that we would put be able to put him on as one puts on a, a garment or armor and help us Lord to walk in him be with those Lord that have checked in tonight some have watched some have popped in for a few moments and then moved on some will watch after this is over and they'll see it on Facebook where we have shared it. And perchance, Lord, maybe somebody will be saved. It is our prayer, Lord, and our desire in the name of Jesus, Lord, we ask. Amen. Okay, well, thank you very much. I hope you have a good night, and I enjoyed spending Bible study with you. Uh, we'll see you Sunday, either on Facebook Live here, or we'll see you in person at the church. Until then, God bless you.